I'll admit it, I've never really played a Metroid game until now, and that's how you know I'm a fake Nintendo fan. But just recently, I finished Super Metroid on the NSO SNES app, and today I just want to talk about what I thought for a bit. This won't be a critique, because saying this game is anything less than objectively perfect is sure to get me banned from most countries, but this will more so be what I thought as a newcomer. Without further ado, let's get started. Hey there, I'm Carno. Okay, so before we get into my thoughts on the game itself, let me give you a little background. I'd always found the Metroid series a little intimidating to get into, not for an abundance of games of course, but just because I was afraid I wouldn't really care for them. And I think this was for a couple reasons. First, the whole idea of a Metroidvania game just didn't seem too appealing. Like this idea where you would constantly just be looking for the next place to go, running around the entire world almost aimlessly, it didn't really sound that fun for me. Like, I'm the kind of guy that likes straightforward stuff. Give me a list of objectives, and I'll be good. And I think a good example of this is that the first time I played Breath of the Wild, I pretty much skipped every non-mainline side quest. I ran to the different divine beasts, completed some shrines in between if they were on the path, and then went straight to Ganon. I didn't even discover Terrytown. And here is my second worry, this game is usually defined as old school hard. Now whenever I hear that phrase, my mind immediately jumps to a couple conclusions. The game will be unfairly difficult, and or it will be overly cryptic. And keep in mind, I don't mind hard games so long as I can immediately retry them. That's actually one of the reasons I love the original Monkey Ball games. But when I feel like I'm stuck for a long time and not making any progress, that's when my impatience kicks in. So anyway, I was nervous that I'd try Super Metroid and eventually drop it out of either frustration or boredom, like what happened when I tried the NES game. But I finally said, you know what, I have NSO, it'll be good to at least open it and see what I think. So I finally opened it up. And the next thing I knew, it was 4.30 in the morning and I didn't want to stop. So needless to say, I thought the game was pretty good. But now let's get into some details of my experience. As far as first impressions go, I was actually pretty impressed with the presentation. Of course I've seen a bit of gameplay before and SNES graphics are nothing new to me, but the cutscenes and the sprites look really good, even today. Now I can see why so many indie games go for that 16-bit art style, because even almost 30 years later, it still looks alright. And when you actually land on planet Zebus and start exploring, I love how they ease you into the formula. The first portion is fairly linear, and there aren't even any enemies until you get the Morph Ball. You have time to get used to the movement and get accustomed with your different abilities. And even after that, the game will lock you into different sections, so when you come to Roadblock, you know the answer is in a specific region, so you don't have to go exploring the entire planet. Good stuff. The Roadblocks are really satisfying to figure out too, at least for the most part. Combing through the different rooms and finally finding that Chozo statue makes for a very satisfying experience. Now when I got to Norfair, that's when I had my first annoyance. See, the game introduced these hot rooms that led to constant damage, and since I still had pretty low health at this point, it wasn't like I was about to start tanking it through. And then there was another hallway that required you to break through some major rubble. So I went looking around for something to get around one of these obstacles, but after half an hour of going through the same small portion of map over and over again, the impatience started to kick in, so I opened the walkthrough in IGN. Like I said, I'm a fake gamer. And I was expecting to have one of those moments where you wonder how you didn't figure this solution out yourself, but the answer only made me feel justified in bringing up the guide. Or at least that's what I was going to say until reviewing the footage, and seeing that you could see it in the minimap all along. So, um, never mind? Maybe this is why I shouldn't have been playing at 3 in the morning. Anyway, after that, I went on no problem, but I always had the walkthrough open on the side just in case. Back to the good stuff though, as I got further and further into the game, it locked me in less often, and usually finding solutions to different puzzles was just a matter of going places I hadn't been. And there were several times when i think, hey, wasn't there a yellow door at that one spot a while back? So I'd head back, and sure enough, there was some optional goodie for me to collect. The map was just the right size too, so that felt big, but not so large that I felt it was too much of a pain to backtrack. And getting new power-ups really felt good. Whether it be an energy tank or something like the space jump, it always felt like you were making progress and reaching places you couldn't reach before. Like, by the end, it was really satisfying to blast through a room of enemies you once had to look out for, or just jumping over the entire thing. 
and it always encouraged experimentation. Like, I know there's a room that teaches you how to dash jump, but I had already found that technique out by just playing around. I'd say the only power-up I didn't really care for was the Spring Ball, and that's only because you get it near the end of the game and the method you use to get it is pure nonsense. At this point, I had set a sort of rule for myself that the only time I'd use a guide is if I had absolutely no clue what to do. But throughout the walkthrough, I'd see it mention how you could wall jump to get stuff. Now, I thought this technique was just some speedrunning trick, because when I looked it up, it was this thing that required very frame-specific presses to execute. So anyway, I never used it and thought nothing of it. I hadn't needed to actually use it till now. But then I got to this giant shaft, and IGN told me to wall jump to where the room with the spring ball was. So I went to the GameFAQ version, and it said the same thing. It was now that I found out that this was a move I could have learned a while ago by entering a hidden room. But no matter, it seems simple enough. Oh, how mistaken I was. I suspect it was my capture card adding the smallest bit of delay. I actually had to pull my Switch out from the dock to pull it off. And whoever designed this room thought it would be a good idea to require 5 to 6 of these things, and also add enemies that will stun you and make you fall all the way back to the bottom. To whoever decide to require this room for progression, I hope both sides of your pillow are warm tonight. Anyway, my closing thoughts on the game. I can see why so many people love it. The world is solidly designed, the presentation is still awesome, the progression is satisfying, and apart from a handful of cases, the puzzles feel good to solve. I'm happy to say that my fears about this game were mostly unfounded. Even that old school difficulty wasn't too bad. In fact, I thought it was just the right amount of challenge. I even went to Ridley with what I thought was a decent amount of energy tanks and still got creamed. But instead of feeling mad, I felt like I was the one who just needed to find some more collectibles. And the two escape sequences that bookended the game were awesome too. Will I play this game again? I honestly don't know. Certainly not for a while, but I did enjoy my experience. And for what it's worth, I did borrow a copy of Prime Trilogy from my friend, but I always felt I had to stand up in order to use the pointer controls, which got old after a while. Nevertheless, if Nintendo ever gets off their butt and releases Prime Trilogy HD, I'll probably try it out. Unless they make it $60, in which case I'll just suffer through the Wii version. Anyway, until next time, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.